Okay, Sabrina is a research scientist at the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Her major interests are number one, child mother tongue language learning and ebook reading. Number two, individual differences in early bilingualism. And number three, harmonious bilingual experience. And her research is about how cognition and environment co-shape the developmental rate and route to early bilingualism and how the bilingual experience influences children's social emotional skills and executive function. We are very happy to have Sabrina with us. Uh, what we are honored today is to have Sabrina to share her research findings in the temperamental traits of young learners when they learn English. Okay, so off to you, um, Sabrina. Okay, thank you very much for my, my Lee's uh, kind invitation. And also I want to thank Sophie's uh, facilitation. Uh, now I try to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. superb. Uh, okay, hello everyone, good evening and uh, my name is Sun He, you can also call me Sabrina. Today, it's my great honor to share this talk about um, private you know, uh, language learning in private language institute and how does uh, temperament will shape children's early language development. I think many of uh, us has such a experience, you know, we probably spend some time in the private language institute and um, maybe since I'm not sure about your generation, but for my generation, it's when I was maybe a primary school student or older, then I start to do this kind of language, um, uh, language intuition. But for many younger generation in China, the children usually start to learn English much earlier. At the age of three to four, um, many parents will send them to the private language institute. You can see from the figure that this is a big industry in, in China, a very huge market. And a, a lot of children you know, start to learn English at a very young age. However, we have very, very little studies about these young learners, very young learners. We know little about them, we, there's hardly any studies about these children. There is also some misconception in the field of early language learning. Um, many parents assume that as long as we start early, they should, you know, function um, as we call high mean, you know, solve a lot of knowledge continually and learn this language easily with, with, without paying special effort. Is it true? Let's look into so, certain things. When I start to you know, focus on this special uh, language population, actually, I couldn't find a lot of useful literature um, studies uh, to, to guide my research. Instead, I look into some studies about uh, ESL learner, English as second language learners. So what does um, ESL refer to? So if you are born, for example, in mainland China, and then you migrate to Canada. You learn um, English in Canada. Then you are supposed to be ESL learners. So English is your second language. In your environment, there's a lot of English input in that context. So there is a study in Australia in 1999, and the researcher really depict the different stages or phases of first year of you, these uh, young, very young ESL learners uh, language development. So for, for the very first few months, these uh, learners usually have a silent period, different from person to person in terms of total length. Children usually uh, repeat or use single words after te teacher's instruction in class. At the second phase, children start to uh, rely less on repetition. And then 
they start to use single construct, construct constructions and uh, to do language switching more often. In the last phase of, of the first year, they, they are more confident in English. And then they start to employ complex in English utterances more often. Okay. Despite these general phases, we have seen a lot of variations among children. So kids are very different from each other in terms of their um, language English learning in the first year. They are different in terms of time of entry into English use, the duration of each phase, and also they are very different from each other in terms of the amount of interaction with teachers and peers in English. Here, I give you several pictures on the right side. So you can see that children are very different when they are um, learning something new. Some children have very long silent period. Some children are eagerly, eagerly uh, participating in so, certain activities. So we, we can also observe such things in, uh, in terms of uh, language English learning in the very first few years or in the first year. So a, a good question is, why children are so different from each other? One possible reason is temperament. Here is a brief definition about temperament. Usually we inherit it from our parents uh, and this kind of a trait is very stable, at least in the early childhood. And um, this temperament formed the core of our personality later in our life. There are some general findings in terms of temperament and uh, early first language development. In the past, we found that temperament easiness can really help children to uh, learn their L1 better. Uh, some traits, temperamental traits like attention, mood, adaptability, and sensitivity, these are all related to language production. If you're good at these temperament traits, usually you have more language production. Lastly, temperament can also influence uh, language learning directly and indir uh, indirectly. Um, I think this is very easy to understand. If a kid is always smile and a very, very, in very good mood all the time. So probably, you know, people around him or her love to talk to him or her more. So they, they, uh, definitely, you know, temperament will influence your language learning indirectly. Okay. Here are three questions in my study. Uh, I want to know in the first year of uh, children's English learning in China, so how do they develop their verbal and behavioral, uh, nonverbal behaviors, body languages, for example? Secondly, I want to know whether children are very different from each other in terms of their verbal and nonverbal behaviors. Lastly, I want to know if children do have a lot of individual differences whether we can interpret such difference by uh, their temperament. Okay, for the first uh, question, my hypothesis is at least we can see some traits, that some development uh, outlined by Clark, the first two phases. Secondly, uh, similar to what had been observed by Clark, we can also see a large variation in children's early English development in China. Lastly, similar to uh, temperament traits have been identified in children's L1 development, I think uh, temperament can also influence children's early uh, English language learning, uh, English as a foreign language learning. In this study, I recruited four children. So two, two girls and two boys from Chongqing, China at the age of three. So they have been taught by the same American teacher and the same Chinese teaching system. Before the, you know, the experiment or the observation, I use parental questionnaire to uh, really ask, so how many uh, hours of English exposure they have home at, at home. So uh, their socioeconomic status, like mother's education level and house, household income, this type of background information. I also test their English vocabulary uh, and see uh, their uh, relative English proficiency. I uh, video them every week for about one year and a half. 
So uh, each time about 70 minutes, their classes are following the same kind of activities like name calling, song, word review, learning, um, activities, sticker, a distribution, something like that. I use a parental questionnaire to um, try to explore children's temperament. Here, I have listed uh, the data I'm going to share tonight. So uh, in this paper, I use about 20 weeks data. I coded children, transcribe what they have seen, uh, said in classroom by teachers and by uh, students. And then I also code children's and teachers' behaviors, especially children's behavior like gaze, um, nonverbal repetition, uh, verbal repetition after teacher, uh, nonverbal response. For example, if teacher asks rapid, what is rapid? Uh, maybe children don't know how to say it, but they can just you know, do the gesture like this. So this is supposed to be a, a nonverbal response. And verbal response is something they can you know, answer verbally. By okay, where's your pen? Then uh, the kid say, said, uh, it's here. And this is uh, considered as a verbal response. Lastly, we also capture their uh, mixed language use between English and Chinese. For uh, children's temperament, we use a uh, New York longitudinal study. So this is a questionnaire with 72 items. Uh, this has been normalized in China, and also there are nine temperament traits. So here are four, um, like activity refers to children's physical energy, whether high or low. Uh, you can see some kids can run all the time. Some kids will sit there quietly all the time. And also initial reaction, how does the, uh, the, the child responds to something um, new, like new person or new environment? Some kids you can see always withdraw themselves from these new uh, settings. And uh, adaptability, like, like how long do, uh, does it, it take a child to adjust to a change over time? In, uh, intensity, regu uh, regularity, yeah. I think for each definition, I will leave it to you to you know, uh, to take a look later. There are also uh, something about mood, whether a child really, uh, is really happy or unhappy. You can see some kid is always smile. A very, very easygoing, like, you know, always in good mood. Um, some kids are just in totally, in, you know, the opposite. And also we have some category as distraction, whether children are easily to be distracted or not, whether they are persistent or not, and whether they are, they have uh, very sensitive to the environment changes. Okay. The first question uh, in this study is to ask, so how does children, how do children develop their verbal and nonverbal behaviors? Um, nonverbal behavior, we talk about gaze, nonverbal repetition, nonverbal response, something about body language or you know, their, their attention. So verbal phase is more about verbal repetition, verbal response, and mixed use of both languages. So here you can see that children in general uh, engage a lot of nonverbal activities or, or behaviors uh, in the first phase, or maybe uh, in the first two or three uh, weeks. But gradually, you know, um, this job quickly um, in the first uh, six weeks. And gradually, the verbal behaviors really, you know, uh, go upward, but it, it really changed a lot. So the whole learning phase is quite dynamical. Then if we look at some trend, so here, there, there should be a zero line, you know, dotted line here. Actually here refers to children, you know, uh, their verbal and nonverbal behaviors are equal in, in terms of quantity. And then you can see some children always you know, um, body language dominant, like uh, this uh, girl called Lemon. And then some, some kid always, you know, really on top, uh, you know, uh, their verbal behaviors is, tr is really dominant in their language production or uh, participation in class. Here is some demonstration of the variation among children. Some keep always on the top in terms of verbal repetition, some always on the bottom. Uh, dotted line is something, uh, you know, about the average level. 
So not only verbal repetition, but also verbal response is like this. So some children always give a, a lot of verbal response, some always on the bottom. And for the third question, it's about temperament. Are children different from each other? Yes, you can see that here, minus one refer to, uh, you know, this kid is below average, below their, their peers. Then um, positive one refers to something, you know, above average, above the peers. You can see the kid Linda is, um, has a lot of negative means that Linda is very low in terms of activity, uh, very, very shy, you know, try to withdraw herself uh, from the new environment. Adam is totally different, you know, very positive, uh, very quickly to adapt uh, to a new environment, very happy all the time. So you can see each kid is very unique. This is something I want to emphasize why we should choose, uh, you know, treat our kids, children, you know, with full respect, because these children are very different from each other from the very beginning. So we should take into our, uh, consideration in our instruction. And now let's get, uh, let me show you some cases like Linda. You know, the girl is, uh, the temperament trait uh, is like this. The girl is very low in terms of initial reaction and activity level, but she is quite high in terms of regularity. For example, um, She's very, very easy to, uh, she, she kind of follow a lot of routines. So what does the, the learning activity uh, she demonstrate in the language class? She has a longest silent period, about three months. She just sat in the classroom and said nothing. And, you know, I, I was observed the teacher instruction. One day the teacher, you know, really exclaimed, oh my, oh my, uh, Congrats, Linda, now you can make a word, you say something. So I still can remember vividly, you know, how happy the teacher was in class back then. But, you know, in week 19, she retreated to silence again because they, uh, change, they have a teacher change. So the, the girl is, you know, retreat back to this kind of shy, silent period. And she has the lowest amount of English production in class. And, but she's very disciplined. So she always sit back, you know, listen to you attentively. So teacher didn't really, you know, um, actually teacher really like her. Okay, for the second case, Adam, you can see the temperament wise, the boy is very active, uh, full of, you know, energy. Uh, very, very, uh, how do you say, show a lot of, a uh, good try out, really want to integrate, uh, you know, whatever uh, sh he has learned into the classroom. He's very happy, always smiles. And, but he, he's not very persistent. Once he's uh, bored with something, he would just give up. So look at his language behavior. He was the first kid to repeat in English in the classroom. He's the first kid to put new words into practice. He has the highest amount of English production. And he also tried to lead other children to say English. And let me show you a case to demonstrate you know, how Adam behave in the classroom. So as I mentioned that Adam is very quick in terms of applying new knowledge. When the teacher says stop, uh, he said stop. And teacher said jump. And the teacher, uh, you know, the, this kid, Adam, say, jump. And then you see he, uh, this uh, Adam uh, say again, stop. So he start to take over this, you know, give some, some um, how do you say, uh, demand. You know, ask the, all the class follow him. And the teacher was amused by him and say, stop the jump. I think this is a good way to show that, you know, how the, the kid really try to uh, adopt this new, uh, new uh, learned knowledge into the classroom and apply it in the activity. So to summarize, um, Adam is very, very quick to adapt to this English setting. And also he got a lot of positive feedback from the teachers because of his uh, you know, activity. And then 
Adam has a higher motivation to learn. And then he has more interaction with the teacher. So this is a really nice circle, you know, to really feedback to Adam's uh, language learning. Let's look at another case, Lydia. Lydia has a higher level of ad adaptation, and but uh, he, she's not very sensitive the, to the demands or the regulations, rules. You know, see, so he was, she was very quick in terms of getting used to the English class. She was the first child to put single words into a sentence. But if she's always driven by her curiosity and not sensitive to the classroom discipline. So in one uh, video, I still remember. So um, Lydia found, you know, uh, okay, the teacher let one balloon go. Then she started to, so she was so drawn by the balloon. And she started to talk to the peer and say, where is the balloon? Can you guess? Let's search for the balloon. Let's stop listening to the teacher. Let's, let's go to search. So she's totally driven by the curiosity. But so, you know, this is more or less related to her temperament, which is very interesting. So let's see some of uh, the cases of Lydia's you know, uh, language exerts. Um, she was the first child in the classroom to try to put single words into a sentence. Uh, so this is uh, the, the girl. She said, uh, she green lily. Green? Uh, yes, lily green, yes. So green, uh, lily is your name, yes. Green, lily, yes, green. So you can see that these kind of cases she tried really try hard to put into whatever learned into practice. Okay, so this is uh, the last case, Philip. Philip has an uh, average level of initial reaction, but she, uh, he has higher level of persistency, but very uh, low in terms of mood. He's kind of not happy in most cases. So his learning behavior is he enjoy uh, world review, but he always demonstrates frustration when not get when uh, not get the attention from the teachers. So here's the example. So when the teacher say or appointed another kid to to read something or play game, he said, I'm angry. I feel angry." Then um, teacher doesn't know what's going on with him, and what what he was murmuring. So the teacher just keep ignoring him, and then he will say. Keep saying like that. Then uh, once I, you know, this is a vicious, uh, really vicious circle because teacher doesn't really know what's going on with him. Then has a lot of mis uh, interpretation of his behavior. Sometimes we will criticize this boy, say, you know, you should obey up the rules or follow the discipline. Then the kid got frustrated because he demands some attention from the teachers. If he can't, he kind of feel really disappointed. Then he start to use English, uh, Chinese to express himself. Then the American teacher really didn't know what's going on, so tend to ignore him. Then this kind of the circle is just uh, uh, kept long. So I think this is a sad story because uh, after five months of observation, I noticed that actually uh, Philip turns to be really demotivated in to some extent, because he really didn't get a lot of attention from teachers. So this is kind of thing we should pay special attention to. Conclusion. For our first question, we partly confirmed uh, Clark's finding. We found something related to phase one and phase two. Uh, there's a delay of English repetition by Chinese students. I guess because uh, we have so few language input, English input. That's why we have a delay to develop such a phase. We also feel a lot of uh, variation, even for, with four children, you can see they are very different in terms of time of entry into English use, the amount of interaction, and their own le English learning style. Lastly, for the temperament early foreign language learning, we found temperament easiness can indeed influence their language production. Uh, a lower level of activity um, is more or less related to less English production. A negative mood and a high level of sensitivity level is really related to teachers' um, misreading of 
children's need, and also it may hamper their motivation and inci incidental learning eventually. Implications of the study. So I think at least uh, this, is, uh, this paper tries to link temperament and children's early language development um, together and to give us a better understanding of why children are so different from each other in, in our language class. Also, it can let us know that, you know, um, we should really, really get to know our students, then we can teach them very well. I, I interview and also survey quite a number of teachers um, in, the, in that school, and I found that for foreign language teachers, they usually need about three months to get to know their students. For Chinese teaching assistant, because of uh, the language advantage, they probably spend less, but still around you know, two months. Uh, the last point is, I think you know, change of teachers can be detrimental for, to some students. Uh, for you know, the first girl, we can see that after changing teacher, uh, she totally retreat to silence. So I think you know, future uh, in the future maybe we can integrate this uh, temperament knowledge into our uh, pre-service teacher training materials, and also we should be more careful about you know instruction. I think a lot of um, individualized teaching should be uh, developed based on our knowledge of our children. And we should, you know, really use this temperament uh, knowledge uh, by, you know, either serving um, parents or get a deep conversation with parents to get to know the temperament of these kids. They, they, uh, this type of knowledge may shorten the period of, uh, uh, to get to know our students. Lastly, I think if we need to change a teacher, we really need to facilitate the handover and let the new teacher get to know the classroom, especially their temperament more. I, I want to thank a lot of um, collaborators, uh, um, my, my co-authors of this study, and yeah, my supervisors and some, some colleagues in the Netherlands. Okay, thank you so much. I, I'm going to stop sharing. Can you hear the clap? <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Sabrina. Um, the last slide actually is very much related to our class because they are all prospective um, teachers. Uh, and today, actually, we devote our sessions to the understanding of <laughs> the young children, you know, how they learn. Yeah, yeah. The findings of your studies are very interesting. Um, some of the students from this group raised a question whether they, they, they are quite puzzled uh, whether native language, Chinese, should be used when there's the communication breakdown with the children. Because um, So will there be any um, insights gained from your observations of those very young children? Yeah, I think this is a very good and valid question. Mm, I published uh, several papers last year about this about code switching, about translanguaging, because you know, uh, in recent years, translanguaging is a very popular uh, teaching strategy uh, in our field. Um, in Singapore also, I think uh, a lot of teachers have the same uh, curiosity or inquiry, whether we should employ more English. Uh, actually here is the opposite. So many, uh, the younger generation uh, is better in English than their mother tongue. So when we teach mother tongue, whether we should employ English. My suggestion is uh, this should be used um, with purpose, with a clear instructional agenda. Um, if you check my uh, 2020 paper on Journal of Child Language, we really uh, categorize nine possible reasons you code switch, teacher code switch, or you know, use this uh, mixed language. So for example, uh, the question from you mainly is whether we should uh, use Chinese in English class with our children. If you have a clear agenda, for example, you know I use this, uh, I use Chinese to enhance children's comprehension, or you know, increase their motivation of learning. 
So either you know some cognitive or affective reason, then you should employ it. But in Singapore, I also noticed some teachers just code, code switch or use this kind of uh, their, their more dominant language uh, due to their own habits. They feel very comfortable of using this. So this is a, their language, you know, uh, how to say, behavior. Then if without a very clear, you know, instructional agenda, we didn't find any significant impact of such use on children's language learning. So eventually this question will go back to how we're going to promote children's language learning and their understanding. If you think you are um, re relying on your mother tongue L1 can really increase children's learning. Yes, please go ahead. If this is totally out of blue, I don't think that's a good you know, um, strategy to, to be employed because the more you use this uh, L1, the more uh, the less time you left for another language, L2 foreign language, whatever. Yeah, thank you. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes. And any other questions? Right. Are you all still in the silent period? <laughs> <laughs> we have the adult silent period. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. I'm yeah. just wondering. Maybe you can um, write down the questions and then I can pass it on to Sabrina for further communication. But, but, but actually, I have one more. Uh, <laughs> again, uh, from them. Uh, you mentioned about the influence of the mood or there's an association between the mood and their language uh, development. I just wonder, uh, did you get any data or any or, or from your observation that what are some of the experiences that will bring about a more positive mood? <laughs> <laughs> it, it will games uh, or um, stories, those kind of things uh, are, are more conducive to bringing in a, a, a positive mood, which in turn, brings about a uh, more positive language progress? That's a very good question. Okay, I think the question you're talking about is about uh, children's motivation, learning motivation. So what type of instruction or activity can really um, make them more curious or more motivated to learn? Mm. Uh, I think in general, there are some activity, as you mentioned, you know, like share book reading, I did a lot of, you know, projects on this. Uh, I can find, you know, with proper questions, the, these type of activities, you know, reading a story can definitely, you know, make children really engaged in learning this language. Um, I also have a series of uh, studies on using uh, electronic devices like, you know, eBooks to engage children. So certain functions like motion, really can uh, engage children better because I use eye tracker to follow children's attention. You can see uh, the design, the well-designed ebook with motion can really uh, you know, um, engage children much longer. So I guess, you know, uh, it's really case by case, but in general, some uh, well-accepted activities in classroom, like games, like reading, these are, you're usually very, very good strategies to motivate your students. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Yeah. Uh, and that, that answer would uh, justify uh, the content of our following sessions you know, uh -huh. of this okay. course. That's why we move on. You know, after dwelling into the characteristics of the young children, we move on to figuring out the effective pedagogies or practices mm. that would, you know, facilitate their language learning. Yeah. Well, um, it's just a shame that we can't talk longer and we cannot have more interaction because of the, uh, the, the barrier on screen. I do hope uh, we, we do have a chance of bringing you physically to our class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, may I, us uh, students to join me uh, to thank 
Dr. Sun once again, you know, for sharing her interesting findings. Okay. And um, I will keep uh, communicating with Dr. Sun. And she has also a group of uh, students who's working in this area. And we'll see, we'll see whether we, we can bring her students and you, uh, the Hong Kong students together for more communication. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work out some, something. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Sabrina. Really, thank you for your precious time. You know, it's the time for you to take care of your babies. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you all. Bye-bye. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.